Spotlight now turns to today's keynote interview. I'm really excited to welcome Troy Carter, who began his career in Philadelphia, working for Will Smith and James Lasseter's Overbrook Entertainment. He has worked for Bad Boy Entertainment, Irving Wonder, which was acquired by Sanctuary Group, and now with Coalition Media Group. Today, Troy will discuss his work managing the world's biggest global superstar. Any guesses, anyone? Lady Gaga, and what it takes to break an artist internationally. Troy has successfully merged traditional marketing with radical new techniques to turn Lady Gaga into a powerhouse of music, fashion, and media. Please put your hands together and welcome Troy Carter together with Michael Schneider on stage. Troy, I want to start by thanking you for planning Gaga's concert around Music Matters <laughs> so you could be here today. I routed the tour around it, yeah, actually. We're all excited that you're here. Um, so could I get my, my slides up, please? So people um, often probably talk to you about Gaga and everything you're doing with her, but you've been in the music business for quite a long time. Starting, uh, is that 15 years ago, 17 years ago? And um, I'd love to hear about how you started and um, how you got into the business, and what were you doing there? Uh, that was a picture of uh, me, Big, and Puff at one of the first concerts that I, I was a concert promoter in Philly, and that was one of the first concerts that I threw in Philly with Big and Puff. And actually, right after that is when um, Puffy ended up giving me the job at Bad Boy Entertainment right after that. Is that where you started? Uh, no, I actually started with, uh, with Will Smith, with Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, working with those guys. And um, kind of learned the business through working under James Lasseter, his manager. And then um, moved out to L.A. when Will went out for Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and uh, hated L.A., moved back to the East Coast to, to do this, and uh, started with Puffy at Bad Boy. And so, um, talk to me about the progression. You, you started with Puffy and Bad Boy, mm -hmm. and how do you wind up managing one of the biggest artists in the world? Like, what was, what was your path? The, um, the path was, well, right after Bad Boy, you know, I stayed there for a couple of years, and, um, and in 99, I ended up, uh, I knew a girl named Eve who was like a rapper from our neighborhood and she came to me to help her look for a manager and um, I kind of took her around to different people and after like our fifth or sixth meeting she said why don't you just give it a shot and, um, and I started working with Eve and we ended up uh, working together for almost 10 years and, uh, and I kind of built my, my original business off of Eve and uh, a bunch of other urban clients and then we sold that to Sanctuary in 2004. Yeah. How did you and Lady Gaga meet? Uh, Gaga and I met through uh, one of my best friends, Vincent Herbert. So Vince, uh, Vince was sent a, a MySpace link, uh, and Vince went on MySpace, listened to the beautiful Dirty Rich song and a couple of other songs, and the next day flew her to L.A. And um, he brought her by my office, and we kind of been moving ever since. And was it kind of an instant thing? You, you recognize genius right away, or did it? Take for, some time. You know, from the, the, the way my office was set up, it was a, a glass office, and you can see out to the reception area, and Vince walked in, and Vince is kind of like, the, you know, this big guy, and then behind him, you saw this girl with, you know, these huge black sunglasses on and these fishnet stockings with no pants, and it was one of those, uh, who the fuck is this, you know, as, as, she, as she's is walking that in. that still around by <laughs> And, um, you know, but, you know, right away, you know, she played Paparazzi and, you know, um, you know a, a few songs that ended up on the first album. But you knew right away that, you know, she was, she was special. Yeah. Awesome. So um, fast forwarding to today. There's a slide there somewhere. Um, you guys are currently in the middle of, a, of an Asian tour. Yeah. Um, how's it going? You had to put that, you had to put that slide <laughs> You know what? It's actually off to, uh, to a really fantastic start. So, you know, we started off, you know, Seoul, Korea, 
and uh, then Hong Kong, Japan, you know, and in terms of attendance records and sales is, you know, it's, re it's doing really well. And we're playing three shows in Singapore next week. Um, but then, of course, you know, it's protesters all around the world that, you know, have, have something to say about it. But, you know, we, we appeal to a very specific group, and, and that's who we're out to please. Does that upset you? I mean, she's this great artist and has this great show, and there's people protesting. I mean, why do you think they're protesting? Do you, do you, how, how, do you, how does she feel about that? You know what? It's, um, you know, like we're going through this thing in Jakarta right now, and the way I look at it, you know, is, is less about Gaga than it is about what's really happening in the world right now as, as a whole. This is just like, a, this is a microcosm. Mm -hmm. And um, I just feel like it's a generational divide. It's a bit of a generational divide. Yeah. But Jesus Christ got crucified, you know. <laughs> but it's, wow. She, she's not, you know, it happens. Yeah. yeah. Are you going to play Jakarta? If, if, we get a, if we get a permit, okay. maybe. What about China? Are you guys, um, do you have any Chinese dates set up? Are you planning to go to China? Yeah, we're actually in talks, you know, um, about going into China. And um, actually, we wanted it to be the first stop on the tour. And, um, but logistically, we couldn't get it figured out. But, you know, China's definitely a market that we plan on playing. So I've seen the show, and um, it's, it's, it's amazing. And it's also um, could be perceived as maybe aggressive, based on wardrobe or other things she's doing in the show. Do you guys change the show? Or is she willing to change anything to be in these markets? Or would you rather just skip them all together? We'll skip them, yeah. You know, we, pl we play the show as is. You know, it's a very specific show to a very specific audience. And, you know, it's, it's one thing when you're playing, you know, to a television audience and, you know, you, you're dealing with, you know, whether it's FCC or whatever, you know, television censorship that you have to deal with. But it's, you know, and you're doing one song, but it's another thing when you're playing, you know, a two-hour concert. And, you know, and truth be told, it's like, you know, she's, she's not up there nude. She's not doing anything that's, you know, provocative for the sake of being provocative. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, I think it's, you know, for people who've seen the show, it's, a, it's a, a, a very liberating message, you know, in between the songs and everything else or whatever. And, you know, right now, a lot of people can't deal with the, the liberating message. Yeah. Yeah. How would you compare the audiences here in Asia to other parts of the world? Um, this is a, in Asia, it's a very, very loyal audience, and, it, and it's an audience that really, really loves music. So, you know, some places we go, um, and specifically, you know, America is, you know, it's one of those, you know, I think what, Gaga specifically has been able to do in America. She's really built an audience of super fans there. But, um, but outside of the super fans, you kind of live and die on top 40 radio in, in, in America. And Asia is one of those markets where, you know, you're greeted with, you know, a thousand people at the airport. You know, there's thousands of people outside of the hotel. You know, they, they want to buy the merchandise. They want, you know, they... they um, is, is not a passive audience at all. So we love coming to Asia. And, you know, we've been here for almost a month now. So, you know, we plan on spending a, a lot more time here as well. So other major artists don't always come to Asia. And you guys are spending quite a bit of time here. Mm -hmm. um, why is that? It's expensive. You know, um, to, to bring a tour, you know, on this tour, I think we have three... It's probably three 747 planes, you know, so, you know, so to be able to take that around is very, very expensive. And, you know, for, for, and I think the difference is she's in a place where as big as she's become globally, she's still a developing act. So we still have to treat her as a developing act and we have to go in and spend time in the markets. And we, um, and so we look at it as an investment and, you know, so where, we can make a lot more money going to other places and playing a little smaller or whatever, but we just look at it as an investment. And a lot of artists, they, want, they would rather put the money in their pocket. Do you think a lot of these markets are all about touring? I mean, people in a lot of markets here don't really buy recorded music. Mm -hmm. um, how, does, how does the breakup between merchandise, touring, and recorded music differ here than other parts of the world? You know, um, so a, a lot of these markets, you know, some parts of Asia, you know, you, you, you deal with piracy issues. Um, you know, 
Japan, you don't have to worry about it. China, you do have to worry about it. You know, for us, it's not about music sales, and, and it's not really specifically about ticket sales or, or ticket sales or merch sales. It's about building that a real long-term relationship with an audience. And what that turns into ends up turning into ticket sales and merch sales and, you know, if whatever kind of recorded music, but it's really about that, that relationship. So awesome long-term, long-term approach. All right. Um, so moving on to the music business as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, the last 10, 15 years have been, well, the last 10 years have been brutal in the, in the music business. Do you think that the music business is in trouble? Do you think that there's tremendous opportunity right now? How do you sort of see the state of the music business? It depends on who you who you talk to, you know. So from, it's it's a new generation of of, of young guys, young entrepreneurs, young artists, you know, um, that are entering the music industry or who have been in it and who sort of had a shift in their model. That if you if you talk to to that side of it, they're going to tell you it's complete. It's the best it's ever been, you know, and they're going to be very, very optimistic about it. And I'm very optimistic about it, you know, just kind of seeing what's happening, you know, with technology, what's happening with, you know, um, electronic music, what's happening with the with the global touring business right now, you know. So I think there are there are a ton of opportunities, and you know, there there are no longer any barriers to entry, you know, before, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you dealt with distribution, you dealt with, you know, uh, cost of goods, you know, there were, uh, you know, recording studios, it was a lot of factors that were involved in becoming a successful artist, and those are broken down. And in terms of being a successful business person right now, I think those barriers are, all, are also broken down. You know, I think where people look at the death and doom is when uh, you look at some of the, you, when you look at the older business models, you know. So if if we were talking two, three years ago, and you looked at, you know, where Sony and BMG and EMI and Universal Music Group and those guys were, it would be a different conversation. But you know, you you sit down and you talk to whether it's Lucian Grange or you know Rob Wells and some of the other guys that that are starting to take leadership in the music industry you know these are the guys that are licensing Spotify and Turntable FM and they're allowing people to you know they're they're partnering up with uh, young startup companies so I, I think it's a different shift and I think the music business moving forward over the next 10 to 15 years it's going to grow exponentially. Do you think that an artist needs a record label today? Some artists do, you know, so it just depends on who you're talking about. You know, if, for me, if I'm, um, if I'm an, an electronic DJ and I'm selling 50,000 tickets a night or 20,000 tickets a night and I'm making $200,000 $300,000 and I'm building this, you know, group of fans, there's no way in the world I'm, I'm, I'm signing with a record label because that audience, they're not purchasing CDs. They're, you know, it's probably 95% digital, I would be willing to bet. And um, I wouldn't use a, a music label. But if you're a, if you're a pop act, you know, it, it's, you know, it's a different cost structure. And, you know, and it's moving mm -hmm. yourself around the world. You know, so it, 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 it kind of depends. You're with Interscope. Uh, uh, Lady Gaga? Yes, yeah. yeah, Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga's with Interscope. Uh -huh. Um, how many more uh, records do you have under your deal? I think, uh, I think it's three left with Universal. Yeah. Okay. And, and after that, would you consider going solo or you plan to stay with the label? It depends. Like, we have no clue what the, what the landscape's going to look like when that, when that deal is up, you know, and who, who knows what the technology's going to look like, what the opportunity's going to look like. Yep. With, what record labels are going to look like. It may be a system there, and, you know, by the time her deal's up, that may be attractive, and it may be a business model there that may be more attractive than us being able to go out and, and do it on our own. Mm -hmm. So moving on beyond music, um, you were on the cover of Wired Magazine this month, and you've expanded your own business mm -hmm. way beyond music. Mm -hmm. Um, what, are, what are your other interests aside from music? How do you find what you're working on um, in terms of technology investments and other things you're doing? Talk to us about everything non-music that you're doing. 
So we've been over, I think it's been a little, a little over a year, we started um, a fund at Atom Factory, our company, and it kind of happened from us taking risk uh, in terms of marketing and working with young startups and um, even some of the larger companies that we were working with. And uh, a lot of people started approaching us about uh, advising their companies and um, uh, their companies and us investing in their companies. And, um, and since then, you know, we've invested in Dropbox, Spotify, uh, Socialcam, Voxer, Uber, you know, um, it's about maybe a little over 30 companies in a, in a portfolio. But, um, you know, it takes up about, you know, we have somebody full time that at our office that works with founders and that analyzes deals for us. And, um, and it's, a, it's becoming a significant part of our business, but not just from a financial standpoint, but also from an access standpoint and just kind of being able to get a real glimpse of, you know, the, the, the technology that's on the horizon and, and you know, a, a, a lot of these guys are, are going to be the you know future world leaders. Did you do that shift on purpose? You made a decision one day that we're going to diversify and we're going to get into tech, or did that just sort of happen by accident? It was it was something that we it was done on purpose, and um, but it was we wanted to be calculated up with with our approach. So instead of us just kind of throwing money at it or just you know investing in random companies, you know prior to us starting to fund. I spent almost a year in Silicon Valley and just you know sitting with guys, meeting with different VCs, and um, and building our allies and you know and developing these relationships. So we kind of know we can develop our own filtering system on how to pick su successful companies. Yeah, it seems like it's a trend right now with Ashton and Guy Osiri and other people mm -hmm. starting to invest in technology. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there's even a point in being in the music business without a tech aspect today? I think, you know, so, when, you know, when you speak about, like, guys like, you know, people look at Ashton Kutcher and Guy Osiri, you know, um, th those are guys who are, they're really, people don't really, uh, don't understand these are guys that are really in the tech business. So where, you know, Ashton is probably one of the smartest investors that, I, that I've met, you know, just in terms of um, his analytical skills and, uh, and, and he really understands, uh, consumer tech very, very well, a, a lot better than, you know, some VCs that I meet. And then, I, you know, so I've learned a lot from, from investing alongside of those guys and a few other guys, and now we're starting to see other celebrities starting to invest, and what I'm hoping is, is that it doesn't become oversaturated with, um, with stupid investments and dumb money and that people are actually bringing on, uh, bringing on analysts that can really look at these deals and understand these deals and, and push these companies forward. What kind of companies excite you? I mean, what do you look for when you're considering investing in a company? Um, disruptors, people who are, people are, you know, with Uber, for instance, Uber is a company that's really come along. How many people know what Uber is, by the way? Shout out of curiosity. All right, yeah, they're not in Asia yet. So. Yeah, it's not in Asia, but you know, and, and Markets like you know New York and and San Francisco and California, you know Uber's a company that's come along and disrupted uh, the transportation industry. You know Spotify is disrupting um, digital distribution right now. So we're just looking for for, for companies that are going to come along and 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 disrupt industries. How does someone approach your fund if they're interested in working with you? I get maybe about. 15 to 20 emails a week from, from founders. And a lot of times I'm getting, you know, whether it's referred through other venture capitalists or other angel fund investors, you know, so people, I'm pretty easy to get to when it, when it comes to that. What kind of phone do you carry? Uh, iPhone. And what if, I'm an app guy, so I need to ask this question. What are some of your favorite apps? What do you use every day? Uh, Spotify I use every day. Uh, Path is one of my favorite apps. What else? I don't want to <laughs> forget any portfolio companies, but those are my Uber. two. Those are the two that I actually use every day. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So tell us more about Adam Factory. Um, what, what does Adam Factory do? Well, the, the, the core of the business is a talent management company, but um, we kind of 
it's a it's a really weird loose structure, you know. So where you know you have this venture, this angel fund, you know, in there. We have our internal creative unit. We have a marketing unit, you know. But it's all kind of built around a talent around talent management. And do you, is part of you investing in tech companies that talent's always going to work with that tech company, or is that totally it's separate? To, it's total totally independent. Yeah. Is your talent also co-investing with you in the technology companies that you're investing? No, we we usually don't. Uh, we don't even usually allow talent to invest in it. Yeah, got it. I don't want to make somebody a hundred million and then lose them a hundred dollars, <laughs> and then have to sit on uh, on the other side and explain I lost you a hundred bucks. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, so there's Gaga, but there's other acts that you're currently developing. Talk mm -hmm. to us about those. Well, we also, um, we manage DJ Cascade on the electronic side and, um, and a few other DJs. Uh, we have a music producer management division with, a, with about 15 producers and writers. Um, Priyanka Chopra, who's a, a huge Bollywood star, we manage her. Uh, we have Grayson Chance, who, you know, he's having an incredible run in, in Asia right now. He actually just left Asia. From, he was here for almost a month as well. And a new band called Mindless Behavior. Yeah. And uh, talk to me about Mindless. I'm, I'm familiar with those guys. That, that is a boy band. Yeah, boy band. And um, where are they at in their, in their stage, in their progression? Uh, they're still in, the, in their infancy. So, you know, with, with us, it was really about finding and building an, an, an audience. And, um, and, and what's, what's interesting is if you're not a young black girl between the ages of nine years old and 14 years old, chances are you've never heard of mindless behavior. <laughs> but you know, if you go to America and the UK and you ask any black girl between the ages of nine and 14, if, you know, we just put a, we just put a t their tour up for sale this past week in, in America and, you know, and the dates are just blowing out in, in a matter of minutes. Is that band gonna make it to Asia? Uh, eventually, but you know, it's really about just laser focusing on their core right now and doubling down on their core and just and kind of moving out from there. What do you consider to be uh, how do you do A and R today? How do you how do you find talent? How do you how do you discover new talent? To be honest, me personally, I'm not out looking for new talent. Gaga's a full time job for me. So you know so pretty much 80, 80 to 90 percent of my time is focused on Gaga. But in terms of things that come come uh, that comes through the company, it's mostly through you know, Grayson. We found you know through a YouTube video. You know, I woke up one morning and it was 30 links to the same YouTube video, and um, and I told my office nobody come in unless you find this kid. And you know, we ended up finding Grayson. So you know, it's uh, is YouTube the new A and R? I mean, YouTube's that... a big is a big A and R source for us. You know, mm -hmm. and, and that way and. And truth be told, you know, in, in this day and age, if an artist doesn't have any following whatsoever, that's a big red flag for me. So if somebody comes into the office and, they, you know, and they're telling me and selling me on how talented they are and what they're doing, and it's absolutely zero social media footprint, or, you know, you go to their YouTube and it's 62 views, you know, that that's telling. You know, it's, I think... Uh, even with Grayson, you know, that was a video that his brother put up on his, his YouTube channel. That was a recital, right, at a yeah, school? Yeah, at a school. Yeah. And, you know, that's probably over 50 million views or something now or whatever. And wow. they didn't have a social media team. It just was really good. And it was the same thing with Justin Bieber, you know, and a, a lot of acts that, are, are, that, are, that have been discovered over the last, you know, maybe five years or so. It, it, it spread virally and it spread naturally. So, you know, so when someone comes into our office and it's just n nothing there, chances are, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing there. How important is it, do you think, that the talent themselves are tech savvy versus just having people around them that are tech it's savvy? It's very important. It's very important. It's your voice and it's you talking to your audience. And you don't even have to necessarily be tech savvy, but you better know how to tweet. <laughs> You know, you better know how to put up a YouTube video, and you know, and um, I think you know that because that's just as important as touring was 20 years ago. This is how you're building your audience, and actually, you know, is and going back to mindless behavior. You know, Scooter Braun taught me a trick. You know, when we went to uh, we went to 
the UK and I was taking Mindless over there to meet the, the record label over there. And we had them tweet that they were going to be at Universal because Scooter told me, you know, he had Justin tweet that he was going to be at Universal. And, you know, hundreds of girls showed up at the office. And sure enough, when Mindless Behavior showed up to the UK and they tweeted, hundreds of girls were at the office waiting for them. And we had never released anything in the UK. We never went to radio or anything in the UK. And it just shows you that, you know, it travels. So, so now when you have these sort of social media tools, you know, you're not stuck in Singapore anymore, like, you know, and having to play for, for a local market, you're, you're all of a sudden on this global platform that, you know, and, that, and there, are no, there are no barriers. So if somebody's got talent, mm -hmm. do you think that it's easier or harder today compared to 15 years ago to get it out there? It's easier. It's, you know, it, Is it easier to be discovered today? A lot easier to be discovered. It's, you know, if you, if you before the, before the internet, and especially before the consumer internet, you only had pretty much radio and, and, and TV that were these national platforms. There were, you know, we didn't, have, we didn't have any international platforms or anything like that. If you, you know, radio is different than overseas where some stations are national radio stations. In America, you had local radio and you had local TV and you, you know, and, um, and you had maybe a handful of national platforms. Now you have international platforms. You put something up, you know, if Madonna was on, on stage in, in New York playing at the Beacon Theater, it, you know, nobody knew but the people in New, in New York and you would have to wait for it to travel around the world or whatever. And all of a sudden, you know, with the, you know, you got people on their iPhones at, you know, at a concert and all of a sudden, you know, by the time they go home, you know, what, whatever happened that night is broadcast to, to, to the world. So it's a lot easier. Do you think it's more, it's, it's a lot easier to, to create content and to distribute it. So do you think it's harder in a way because it gets filtered out? There's so much content today being created. No, I just think it's um, the, the, the cream rises. I think the cream rises for sure. Cool. Do we have any questions in the audience? Anyone want to ask? Okay. I'll keep going then. You know what, it's, um, the answer would be specific to, to, the, to the artist, you know, because one, one marketing plan isn't going to work, necessarily work for the next artist or anything like that. But um, I think that, you know, the first step is just being able to have quality music and quality product, you know, because if, if you're dealing with real talent and a, and, a, and a real act, then it makes it a lot easier to be able to get it out there. You know, for us, you know, from, from, from the seat we sit in, it's a lot easier, you know, just because it's relationship based. So we're, we're able to, whether it's picking up the phone and calling a radio station or whether it's, you know, being able to call YouTube to be able to get prime placement or, you know, being able to call Michael to build an app for us that can, you know, can, can reach a broad audience. So it's just very specific to, to, to the artist. So, and, oh, right there. Uh-oh, <laughs> uh-oh. <-oh. laughs> this isn't going to be a softball. No, 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 it's, it's a good question. The, with this international platform of social media that we have today and this instantaneous awareness or instantaneous grassroots and that, talk about how that relates to the longevity of an artist's career. I think one of our fears today is they are found so quickly, they explode so fast, but then do they disappear very quickly? Very, very good question. It's um, because that's something very specific that we had to deal with with, um, with Gaga's success because all of a sudden she came out of nowhere and it was like this. So one of the things that was important to us with, with as fast as she, as she grew, it was about not skipping a step. So it was okay, we have the ability to go and play theaters right now, but you know what, let's go and play nightclubs because you know, we really can kind of have her develop her live act there and we can really build a, an audience. One of the biggest things for, for, for us as a company is the discovery process and making sure that some audience 
feels like they have ownership in it. Because when it moves too fast, the worst thing for us is to have somebody discover one of our acts at Top 40 Radio or on American Idol or one of these larger platforms because uh, people don't feel like they have ownership in it. Uh, one of the other things, too, and which goes back to, to, to Michael's question about whether we were willing to change the show and make compromises is about really we cater to a very, very, very specific audience. And this is an audience that we feel like they're going to be there, we, that we're going to have longevity with. And this is the audience that hopefully 20 years from now, Gaga can still be playing for this audience as they grow older and as she grows older. And, and so it's very important that she maintains her loyalty and, and integrity with this audience. And hopefully they'll, they'll follow her. But I just think it's about really not skipping a step and just doubling down on, on what, what, whatever audience ha, has found you. Do you believe in this idea? I mean, do you th has Gaga made it? I mean, are, do you feel like no. you're still? No. So she's one of the biggest artists in the world right now. She's a big, she's a, she's a 200 pound toddler. <laughs> she's a 200 pound toddler. Yeah, but you know, but you know, the truth is, and it's a reason why we are in, you know, when we come to Singapore, we are going to be in Singapore for a little over a week and we're going to spend time, you know, it was important to us that we weren't coming into a market, you know, playing really quick and leaving and going to the next place. It's about really diving deep with the fan base, diving deep in these local territories, spending a lot of time in the local territories. It's, it's mind boggling to me that, you know, you look at some of the, 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 the older legacy acts that have never played India before. You know, just because it was no money in India, you know, but, you know, it, and, and the decision to go there was a financial decision versus an artist development decision. So, Are you playing India? Yeah, we're, pl we're playing India. It, uh, but it's, um, and truth be told, we won't make any money playing India, you know, but it's one of those decisions that we had to make just in terms for, for, for long-term growth. So... But yeah, we don't, I don't feel as though she, she, she's made it yet. You know, when, if you ask me this question 25 years from now, and, and it may be a, a different answer, but you know, it's, it's, a, it's a long, long, long way to go. How does she feel? Does she feel stable and her fan base is worldwide or is she on the edge as well? She's on the edge as well. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's the reason why, you know, she's, you know, one of the things I said, you know, is ironically, it was a year ago yesterday that we released the Born This Way album and we started the tour to Born This Way album about a month ago, you know, so, and it, so that's one year gap between the time we released the album and when we started touring the album. And it's gonna be a, an additional year by the time that tour is over. So it's a, really long, it's, a, it's a really long album cycle, but it's part of the storytelling and, and, it's, and it's part of that investment. And you know what, it's, it's not, in, if, if it was up to the music label, I probably would have been putting out another album this week or whatever, <laughs> but you know, it's, 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 that, it's that development. And, we, 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 and we're just continuing to invest in the artist development. Do you believe that the album cycle is still relevant today? Very, very much so. I think it's, um, but I think it's a, it's a, I came up in, a, like, I came up in the 90s uh, music business, and it was funny because, you know, I was around, I was almost like Forrest Gump, kind of being around these weird situations where, a, you know, a, a guy that I came up with, you know, from our neighborhood ends up becoming the biggest movie star in the world. You know, you got these kids from around the corner from me, you know, who grew up singing uh, literally on the corners doo-wop, became boys to men, you know, and broke all of Elvis Presley's records. Uh, one of our friends, you know, moved to Atlanta and she... Uh, called us up, said she was, you know, starting a singing group, and they became TLC, one of the biggest girl, girl groups of all time. So, and that, that state, but during those stages, these were album cycles. When you look at Boys to Men, Cooley High Harmonies, that was a three-year cycle. That, you know, and they were able to go, and work. They, did a, they probably did a year and a half promo tour, just being able to get around the world. And to be able to go around the world takes a long time. You know, to go continent to continent and to really spend time, you're meeting the people locally, you're, you're going to their restaurants, you're eating their food, 
that it, it means a lot when you go when you go into those countries. So you know, so our plan from the very beginning of of, uh, of both albums that we released so far was to really be able to take that time and tell the story. Were you at Coachella this year? Yeah, I went for a couple of days. Did you see the hologram? No, I missed. I ended up flying to Asia, so I missed the hologram. Do you think there'll ever be a point where there is a virtual production and people go and they go to some sort of room that's optimized for sound and have that kind of experience? Or do you think that artists will always, do you think technology is going to change touring? Well, well, it's happening. You know, um, you have some hologram artists that are, you know, selling multiple nights. I heard the Tupac hologram is about to go on tour. <laughs> Maybe, you know, I think it's interesting. You know, I, you know, so for, if, if the fans are going to show up and that, you know, it's, a, it's a, 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 big, a big part of the audience at Coachella, I would be willing to bet 99% of that audience have, has never saw Tupac play. They probably, some of them weren't even born when Tupac died, you know. So for them to be able to experience, you know, Tupac live in concert, for me, if I was able to experience Bob Marley, I would, I would pay a ticket price. You know, I would pay a, a good... A hundred bucks to be able to go and just experience it, you know. So, so for some people, it, you know, it'll be good. I, you know, as Maybe long as it doesn't are no become a gimmick. Us. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've got a question for both of you. That's Robert Singerman. Hey, Troy. Um, we were talking about a year ago and the language thing, but maybe for a mobile app now to, for uh, Gaga to speak in Bahasa with all the stuff that's happening to hit the language community that doesn't speak English might be something to discuss here. You know, the uh, voice transference? The, you know, we were talking about holograms to follow from that. Do, do you have any plans to record in other languages or we, we, use technology to record in other we languages? We talked about it, and I guess the big thing was, you know, it has to be, it has to be an authentic experience, both for, um, you can't fake it. So, like, so for the fans and for, God, and, for, and for the artists, I think it's just important that it's an authentic experience. And I think more than just the language specifically, I think it's a respect of the culture that resonates with people more than it is you having to speak in, in their specific dialect mm -hmm. than it is a, a real respect of the culture. So if there was technology that allowed Gaga to sing in English and then take her voice and sort of morph it into that local dialect, would you be open to that? No. <laughs> Too bad. Yeah, we, we, we talked about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it just, I think the big thing was it just, it has to feel, it has to feel like, an, it has to be an authentic experience. The audience, they'll smell it a mile away. Yeah. And, there's, and, there's, and there's a reason why you can go to a place like Indonesia where you've never spoken their language and you can sell, you know, 50 or 60,000 tickets, you know, t to these kids or whatever, because this is the la this is the language that they're that they're speaking. You know, they're they're they they're feeling the movement. So I don't think I think it's less about the dialect than it is about the, what 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 they feel. Yeah. Yeah. One over there. Hey, Troy, uh, Miles from PRS in London. You, you guys, you've just done such a phenomenal job in the last few years. My question is just Thank about you. Interscope and Sony ATV and working with them. How complicit have, have your, uh, your relationship with them? How, how has that helped? It's great. They just let us do whatever we want. <laughs> so, so you, know, uh, you know, it's, you know, we, 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 I think the time that I've invested was really, as Gaga was going around the world, you know, digging in with fans, I was kind of going around the world meeting with business partners and just really figuring out who the best, best people were to work with in those companies. And, uh, and I have to say, you know, U Universal specifically, they, they, have some, they have some wonderful people, you know, J the Japan and, you know, and uh, Polydor and, you know, the, the Canadian companies. There's a bunch of people within these companies that, that have helped us out tremendously. And, and, you know, I joke about them letting us do what, what we want to do. But at the same time, I let them do what they want to do. So a lot of these guys, know their, they know their local market a lot better than I'll know their local market. So they'll know, you know, and, and I trust them on it. So we've developed this trust. And, you know, they, they've done a, an, an amazing job globally. Thank you. Yep. 
Microphone. Thanks. Uh, I'm really excited that an uh, artist like Lady Gaga is reaching international success, so credit to you for that. And um, Jerome from Pro Soul in Beijing, would you feel concerned about the situation in America, and does that motivate you at all to uh, look into markets like new frontiers like China, which are challenging, and yet we're in a place where Lady Gaga is, is really popular and uh, there is a big market? Which, which situation are you referring to? Uh, just the change in the economy and, and, and such in, in America and compared to some of the other countries in the world right now. You know what? It's, um, that's a really good question. And, uh, and you see certain markets, you can, you can track consumer buying habits. You know, it's, you go to Greece right now, and you're, <laughs> you're going to have a problem. You know, so it's... Um, so we do pay attention to, to, to that specifically as we're mapping out where we're going to play. And, you know, and some markets are going to be slower than other markets because of what's happening in, 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 in their local economies. But, um, but for us, it's, it's going back to how do we, uh, it's about sustainability. So we know that eventually China is going to become a mature music market and India is going to become a, a mature music market. Africa is going to become a, uh, a mature music market. So if we're, be, if we're there and we're there before everybody else and we're, and, and we're there in a very, very real way and we're planting those seeds, then hopefully as those markets grow, we can grow along, uh, along with the markets. Uh, one way over there. Uh, hello. Yeah. Can I sure. speak, Go. Michael? Go ahead. <laughs> uh, this is Scarlett. Choi, we uh, actually exchanged email um, before uh, from China. Uh -huh. uh, my question: I have two questions. One is, uh, I don't, uh, you know, you kind of answer the question for this time for Lady Gaga to to come to China. I don't know if it still will happen. Uh, I think it's strategically important uh, for Lady Gaga to be in China in the near future because I think China needs Lady Gaga <laughs> and uh, because, you know, Lady Gaga is a representative of modern youth culture in the world and I think the Chinese would love to have you be there. But if not this time, how do you think how near the future that uh, she will come to Asia again? This is question number one. Question number two is, um, will you spend more time for promoting your artists in China because you know the tours like YouTube or Facebook they are not available in China we have other tours locally which means your team has to sp uh, spend special effort in promoting your artists beyond Lady Gaga your other artists in China which means you might have need to have a team locally or in the region how would you handle that uh, for the Chinese market well, um, to, to answer the first question, where um, China is a huge priority for us and uh, for for Torin. So, you know, but of course, you know, we have to go through our process and get permitted and 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 everything else or whatever. And we're very very bullish on the territory. So we feel like you know she'll do well, she'll play well there. And you know, just judging from all of the data that that that's coming in, so it's a big priority for us. And we're we're hoping that we'll be able to put it in on, on, on this tour for sure. Um, and then if not uh, China specifically, we, you know, Asia is just, we, we, we love it here. So, you know, we, we'll be spending a lot of time here. And for, for, for the second half of your question, Asia is a huge priority for Atom Factory as a company. So, you know, and, and we know that and, and especially, specifically with China, because China has its own social media tools and, and China has its own uh, technology that's specifically, you know, that's specifically made for, 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 for China. We've been very, very, very hesitant about our approach to it because uh, we, we, want the, we want the approach to be right. And because of the language barriers, it ha you know, and because with, like with Gaga specifically, Gaga controls our own Twitter and our own tweets and everything like that. So we have to make sure that it translates properly and, and, and everything else. So right now I'm working on something that's probably going to be announced in the near future that that's going to address, you know, um, 
our, our approach to, 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 to Asia, but specifically to China. One last question. Over there, far end. Good morning, Troy. Um, all respect to your work. I'm coming from Indonesia, and I'm actually uh, questioning about the Lady Gaga concert in Indonesia because there's a lot of controversy going on. And in about one and a half week before the concert, the permit is, is not there yet, uh, as, as in public. Uh, my question is that uh, there's a lot of pressure from the religious groups, and there's, uh, they want Lady Gaga, if, they act if she actually performs, for her to actually compromise and tone down the dresses and, and the way she presents herself. Uh, the question is, are you going to compromise with this uh, if the permits uh, comes, comes up? Well, that's Indonesia. not that's not actually true. So um, the religious groups actually don't want her in the country. So um, so they're not looking for they're not looking for a compromise on wardrobe or anything like that. I think that's something that um, that the promoter and the organizers that they that they want to offer to the religious groups. But you know the religious groups they basically don't don't want her stepping foot on the soil. And I, I, I and I like I said earlier, I don't think that's about. Gaga, I think that's about change, you know, and I think this is something that we're starting to see all over the world, you know, and um, and was was very interesting about that about Jakarta and 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 what's happening in Indonesia. We sold we sold more tickets there and 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 the fastest amount of time than probably anywhere else in the world, and we haven't had this sort of resistance where her plan in any other market. So when you look at the juxtaposition between what's happening with this youth movement that are embracing it and on their side, there when I tell you, I've never seen this amount of activity on with, with social media around around this sort of subject with her versus, you know, so what's happening with the with these kids that are looking for liberation, change and Shit, just to have a good time and party when, um, you know, when, when she comes to town versus, you know, the, the extremes these, that these religious organizations are going through to, to stop this. I, you know, I don't think this has anything to do with Gaga uh, uh, as much as it has to do with, you know, it's just a big, you know, cultural and generation gap that, that's happening over there. But, you know, it, you know but for, for us, you know, like I said, you know, earlier, it's... It's being respectful of a culture, so you know. So I, I, I don't think certain things are, you know, if if Gaga's going and she's playing in front of, you know, a group of twelve-year-olds at a bar mitzvah, she's not gonna do, you know, certain things or whatever. So you know, I just think that just comes with a matter of of, of respect. But I think with this, you know, I think it's it's. You're dealing with a few different things. You're dealing with politics because you know it's, it's things that are happening on a governmental level. You're dealing with religion, you know, and uh, so it's it's a little bit more complicated than her changing her outfits. We'll find out in a week, right? What happens? <laughs> Last question. Right. Thank you, Troy. Hello, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Troy and Michael. That was absolutely great insight into artist management and the digital music industry. So what you gonna do when the world comes calling?